Good morning. Today in our series of messages, All You Need Is Love, we're going to talk about loving like Jesus. I believe everyone learns through, best through models. The best model we can have for learning about loving relationships is Jesus. In our scripture passage this morning, Jesus reminds us that we're to love one another the same way he loved us. We are to follow his loving example. Pastor Scott's goal this morning will be to reveal Jesus as a model for loving relationships and the personal implications of how we can follow that model in our own personal relationships. So please open your Bible, pull out your message outline, and follow along in the worship bulletin as I begin re reading in John chapter 13, verse 31. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. People just seem to learn faster and better when they have a model, an example, a, a template. Well, for Christians, Jesus is our example. He's our mod model. He came so that we would understand what Christianity was all about in terms of what we say and how we ought to act. Our scriptures make it very clear that God loves us and he wants us to love those around us. He said, love each other in the same way that I have loved you. And in John 13, 36, I have given you an example to follow me. Do as I have done to you. We need models, we need examples in our life because, well, what is true is we pass on whatever we've received, good or bad. As we seek to love other people, it's often in proportion to how we have been loved as people. God wants us to understand just how much He loves us. He wants to enable us through the Holy Spirit to love others the same way that He loves us. Three key elements to God's love. That's our target for this morning. One way that God shows His love to us is that He's a God who accepts us. Yes, He accepts us really more than we deserve. John 6, 37, the Father gives me my people. Every one of them will come to me, and I will always accept them. It's great to know that God accepts us. We need to be accepted, don't we? In fact, I think the greatest pain in life, the greatest injury in life is not a, a broken bone. It's being rejected. Rejection is so powerful in our life. It, well, I, I can prove it to you. Just look at the crazy things that people do just to be accepted by those around them. A 15-year-old boy in Michigan stood in a circle of his peers. For the next two minutes, they punched him and kicked him. After that, he became a member of the gang. 
He was asked, why would you do that? He said, I knew it was going to hurt really bad. But I knew after that that I would be loved and accepted by everyone who had punched me and kicked me for the rest of my life. We do crazy things just to be accepted, just to experience love in our life. God does accept us. In fact, He accepts us so that we can accept Him. He loves us so that we can love Him in return, the Bible says. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Now, when I say God accepts us, that doesn't mean he's happy or pleased with all of our behaviors. He accepts us, he loves us, but he doesn't love our sinful behavior. We know that because of An example like the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. You know the story. Jesus makes it clear that he accepts this woman. And because he accepts this woman, everyone else should accept them because they're imperfect too. Notice he does not condone her adultery. He accepts and loves her, but he desires her to change as well, doesn't he? God, God's acceptance of us really helps us respond to God and love. In fact, I, we can't love God except for the fact that he loved us first. And I believe we really can't love other people as we could without the love of Jesus Christ in our life first. He loved us so that we could love him. He makes us holy and acceptable to God. Now, we know we're not holy and acceptable to God. It's interesting. I don't have to convince very many people of that. Because we know we're imperfect. We know we're sinners. And some of us are bigger sinners than others. But we're still all sinners. We're still all imperfect. And God's desire is to be in relationship with us. He knows we can't be in relationship with Him because He's holy and we're not holy. And so He makes us acceptable to Himself through his own actions in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is holy. And as Jesus Christ is the leader of our life, then he makes us holy enough to be in relationship with God. The scriptures are clear about this truth. For Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. He's the righteous. We're the unrighteous. He's died for us so that we might have life with Him, not only now, but for all eternity. The implication is simply this. If God loves us in our sinful state with all of our imperfections, then we must love those around us with their imperfections. Ooh, I have to do that? Yeah. Now, why would we love someone else in their imperfections? And there's a simple test for you to take when you get home. Look in the mirror. We're all imperfect. And because we're all imperfect, that makes the ground level at the cross. And yeah, we think our our goodness is better than somebody else's goodness, that their imperfection is way worse than our imperfection. But the fact is, is we're all imperfect. 
We all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Some of us just farther than others. First Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. How do, we, how do we love someone else in their imperfections? Well, love is patient and kind. Are you patient all the time? Are you kind all the time? It is not rude. It is not irritable. You've been irritable lately? Keeps no record of wrongs, and we're really good at doing that, aren't we? In fact, we're so good at it, we usually create a plaque or a monument to the wrongs that have done to us, but that's another method. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful. If you want to love like this, you'll never love like that with your own willpower. The only way that you will love that way is through God's empowering love in your life. And what empowers us is the realization that we have our faults too. That we too fall short of God's glorious ideal. That we're rude, we're irritable, we want to keep records of wrong, that we're really not all that hopeful or faithful. He is to us, and because He is, He calls us to love in the same way, and He empowers us to be successful in that effort. A second way that God loves us is that He values us. We are infinitely valuable to God. Here's a great example, Luke 12. What is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins, two cents. Yet God does not forget a single one of them. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Well, good. Well, he could have said crows. At least sparrows are little and cute. We are more valuable to him than what he's created, Jesus is saying. In all of its majesty, in all of its splendor, we are more valuable than anything else that God created. Have you ever thought about what makes something valuable? It's really two things. Number one, it's an issue of who made it. Who made it? Now, maybe you didn't take art appreciation in college. I didn't. And I have stood before masterpieces and thought, well, you know, that's good. And then realized that, no, it's not just a good painting. It's a masterpiece. And why is that? Oh, Van Gogh, Picasso. Whose name on the bottom makes a big difference. Yes, there is a difference in price between a Timex and a Rolex. And that's about who made it. In fact, once in my previous church, I was running an auction and I, I had a pro football jersey, probably worth 60, 70, 80 bucks. Go online, buy one. I sold that football jersey for $2,100 that night. Now, why would anybody pay $2,100 for a San Francisco 49er jersey that they could buy online? Because it didn't have Jerry Rice's autograph on it. You have God's autograph on you, the Bible says. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You're valuable because God created you. You're valuable because 
of what God was willing to pay for you. Have you thought about that for just a value really has to do a lot with what someone's willing to pay, isn't it? I've learned a little bit about real estate in the last couple of years, listening and hanging out. And you know, it's interesting, your house is only worth what somebody will pay you for it. And if you think your house is still worth what it was worth three years ago, put it on the market and find out really fast. It's not as valuable to everybody else as it is to you. And that's proved out. No one will pay that price for it. It's only worth the price that somebody's willing to pay for it. You are invaluable to God because He has paid the greatest price in the entire universe for you. He gave His very life. He paid the ultimate price. 1 Peter 1.19 He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Because you're valuable to God, because God esteems you, we are called to esteem one another. How do you esteem or value someone else? Well, I can tell you simply, it's what you say and what you do. Peter gives us an insight into how to esteem another person in terms of what we say and do. In the message, he writes, treat everyone you meet with dignity. Hmm. As royalty. As a star. There are people we have a tendency to devalue in society. It's a good word for us to, to treat everyone we run into with great dignity. They too are created in the image of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins too. The New Living Translation says, respect everyone and love. And it's amazing how if we respect those around us, that impacts what we say and what we do, doesn't it? If you value someone, do you gossip about them? Do you slander them? Do you put them down? Do you yell at them? Do you exclude them? Do you avoid them? Oh, yeah, you do. You'll pick another aisle in the grocery store just because they're there, right? Dignity, respect, that's how we esteem another person. Why should we esteem other people? Because God esteems us. He values us. A third thing, and I think this is one of the hard things about God's love, and that is, is that He's a forgiver. We think God is a wrong keeper, don't we? We think God has a, an iPad with a page on it with our name. Every once in a while, a little angel flutters up and writes down all the things we've done wrong by 10 o'clock. Don't we? We do. We have that belief because we think somehow we're supposed to pay. Somehow God's mad at us. Somehow God wants to condemn us instead of save us. But the truth is, is that God is not a fault finder. He's a fault forgiver. He forgives us of our sins. I am the God who forgives your sins, and I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. And if God doesn't hold our sins against us, then why are we doing that? Then why are we holding the sins of someone else? 
towards us against them. Forgiveness is a concrete expression of God's love in our life. There's nothing better that God can do for us than to forgive us of our sins. Long ago, even before he made the world, Ephesians 1, 4, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. What's God's plan for you? He wants to put you on his team, have you be a part of his family. He doesn't want you carrying around the, the guilt and the shame of your mistakes, your failures, your miscues. He wants to wipe clean the slate, John tells us. And when we confess our shortcomings, our sins, our imperfections to Him, He holds us against us? No, forgives us. He's that kind of a loving God. He loves us even when we don't deserve it. He forgives us even though He is righteous and has been given the power to judge us. Now we like God's forgiveness in our life. The hard part is that He calls us to forgive those around us. You must make allowances for each other's faults. I don't like to do that. I really, I, I don't like to make a lot, I like to avoid other people's faults. And the idea that you have to make allowances, what the Bible is really saying here is, is no, you don't get to avoid them. You've got to be involved with them, and you've got to love them, and here I am not talking about an abusive circumstance. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We ought to have good boundaries, healthy boundaries in life. What I am saying is, is that one of the ways we try to deal with those we need to forgive is we try to forget them instead of forgive them. And the Bible is clear here. No, you've got to stay in relationship with them and make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive the person who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Jesus says in Luke 6, forgive and you will be forgiven. If we're going to forgive, there's two key issues we must wrestle with. Number one is that they may never understand just how much they've hurt us. We have to be willing to give up that right. The acknowledgement of our hurt, and it, doesn't, it, it always feels better when someone who's hurt us knows they've hurt us. Doesn't that make us feel a little bit better? See, I told you you're a jerk. I'm proof of you're a jerk. We have to give up the right for our hurt to be acknowledged by the other person. And then the other thing we have to give up is the opportunity to get even. Played a little football in high school. I was an outside linebacker. And outside linebackers kind of live by a little code, and that is, is you may have gotten the better of me last play, but watch out. I'm going to get the better of you on this play. I'm going to what? I'm going to get even for you running over me the last time. You hurt me, now I'm going to hurt you back. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus says no. His goal is reconciliation. Reconciliation always starts with forgiveness. You won't always reconcile with everyone you forgive because reconciliation takes two people. But forgiveness 
only takes one. Isn't that what this meal is all about? It's about the one who forgives. We can only be reconciled to God because God wants to reconcile with us. He does love us. He accepts us with all of our imperfections. He values us more than anything else that He created. It doesn't matter how heinous your crime is. There isn't anything that Jesus Christ can't and won't forgive. God demonstrated His love. And yes, He wants us to to demonstrate His love to one another. He didn't wait for us to start. He started first. He took the bread and he broke it when he sat with the disciples. He made it clear, I, I'm, I'm given my body. And if that were not enough, he sealed his love and forgiveness of us with his very own blood. All I have to do is talk about forgiveness and I know you've got little pictures of people, certain circumstances in your life that push right up to the front. When the Bible talks about valuing others, yeah, we know that there's some people we really don't value. We avoid them, we overlook them, we ignore them. And when it comes to accepting other people, we we want to accept all the best foot forward we can get our arms around. But love them in their imperfection? We are to love one another as Jesus Christ loved us. And let me help you out here. That's sacrificial love. It takes sacrificial love to love others the unacceptable, the devalued, the failures in your world and in this world. But we must. We can because of all that Christ has come to do. In this service as we take communion, share these words as the bread is passed, this is Christ's body broken for you. Take it individually. God loves you personally. As the cup is passed, share these words, this is Christ's blood shed for you, and I want you to hold the cup because we like to symbolize as God's family that we're going to be a loving family one way or another. Yeah, we're all in this together. That loving other people starts with the person right next to you this morning. And then it goes out in concentric circles to people we don't even know on the other side of the planet. God loves us. Let us take that in this morning. Let us return that to Him as we celebrate this supper. Would those assisting please come forward?